this has been one of my most exciting podcasts. Someone I've known for a while, someone I'm genuinely excited to catch up with. Yeah. He is a writer, actor, producer, dancer. He is a very talented individual, and I'm very, <laughs> very lucky to have him on the show. Owen H. Dunn, what's going on, buddy? Uh, nothing much. I am just chilling on the couch in New York, you know, <laughs> at my friend's place. Whereabouts in New York are you? I am in Harlem for the next couple of weeks, um, hanging out, working, and kind of being camped out here, doing a lot of, like, work, freelance stuff, trying to, like, you know, pay the bills, maybe, or try mm -hmm. to get some work going. I don't know. It's, it's rough out here for freelance artists these days, especially in film. I know that life way too well but yeah. that's a great way to start so owen one of the cool things about you as i mentioned you like to be you're a writer you've been very involved um in short film circuit you've had yeah. your some of your stuff get honored and i've seen you on red carpets basically i know what you are all about why don't you tell the, my audience what exactly you're pursuing with all your content creation and such? Um, I am just about spreading love. And I mean that as, as hokey as that sounds kind of in a way, like cliche. I really mean that. I think that I occupy a space in my life that is not necessarily always welcomed in all spheres of life. And so I kind of have just tried to, with my art, create a space that is one navigable for people like me and two is safe for people like me and accepting and really honors and respects their thoughtfulness their genius their artistry their personhood and so mm -hmm. um that's kind of what i've really hoped to do and in my film work at least i really kind of have focused on these small in between moments these moments as i say as a filmmaker i think that life doesn't like the, the moments in life where we have these big huge moments are so far and few and fleeting like a wedding or mm -hmm. a funeral or a big huge thing like that but most times the moments when we have that we have that shape our uh, who we are and us as a person most often are these small moments when we're putting away the groceries or we can't open this bag or we're lost going somewhere it's those moments when we really kind of are tested and find our character and yeah. I like exploring those moments and exploring them on film because I feel like so many times the biggest moments in my life like I remember personally one sitting in a theater and it's one of the biggest most impactful moments of my life and to have the people in the room it's just it was a school field trip <laughs> so like it's it's about where you contextualize that and I think that it's always intrigued me how one event can happen yet 15 different stories could be told in that same event if there are 15 people in that room i always thought that was cool wow <laughs> like you and i think very similarly with that and also the storytelling part mm -hmm. as someone i mean clearly i'd like to put myself amongst all filmmakers and <laughs> from all over i mean who has jimmy stewart and the marvelous miss mazel and the cast of atlanta all yeah me. It's very Confident. great, it's great. And you know, spread out through all over. And I love, you know, I love movies and TV. And as I got an older and got my degree in film, and as I pursue a career in production, I really learned how important one thing you mentioned is character and the story itself. Mm -hmm. And even in the most bizarre plots, whether it's some insane sci fi film or it, that, you know, though. Maybe some of the situations that it could be complex of like if you Star Wars, for example, which is great and mm -hmm. influential, you know, it's influential film franchise. And even if you're not a Star Wars fan, you can see that this guy, Luke Skywalker, is just trying to overshadow, is just trying to fulfill his destiny. Mm -hmm. I mean, even beyond all these, you know, lightsabers and all these mm -hmm. battles, it's just a guy who's just trying to, you know, see what his potential get out of his father's shoes, you know, spoilers, uh -huh. who doesn't know. <laughs> and even, even in something in you no know, space, in that space and time, there's a great story in there and there's a connection because I think all of us connect with um, 
a character like that, whether it's ourselves or someone we know. Do you feel the same way? Like how important character is? Yeah, I think the character is really important. Secondary to like what you're trying to say and why you're saying it. I think the character is inevitably important because there are us as the audience's anchor point into the story. They're our point of entry. And so Mm -hmm. we innately have to like them sympathize with them or understand them so we can gain entry and find access into this world and so i think i find it really interesting that the fact that like in doing that is an intriguing and always well founded way at finding where you're going and what the world is because i think Mm -hmm. that like these characters were kind of watching them stumble through this world and figure out their stuff and if you don't really have a strong sense of character in the story, then it can cause problems with them, you know? So yeah. that's kind of what I was thinking. Um, I think, and I think that um, a lot of times people don't, they write kind of basic, yeah, you guys are good. Um, but they write kind of like basic, kind of like not that complex or in-depth characters, or they're kind of just vapid and they use the, rely on like stock tropes and tenets in order to be lazy and have to kind of expedite the film process. Um, but I ultimately think that you kind of noticed it. And I think that's why we've seen this in massive dearth in uh, r- original content, but also seen this intense want for original content because we want characters we haven't seen before. We want characters yeah. who are not this cis hetero white man who maneuvers the world, getting what he wants and going for the girl. Like we're tired of this. We want yeah, we've seen that many times. Like exactly. So we want people who look like the world around us. And we're now so more exposed to the world as a people because of this social media and this network of people that exist out there, that the ability to sell a lie is significantly harder now because we have a shared consciousness and collective knowledge of what these things are. And if we don't know them, we can go Google them or look them up. So the authenticity is an inevitability with the information like overload that we have today. Right. So you know, as you mentioned with original content, the rise of streaming services, uh, whether obviously HBO Max has influence, Netflix, Hulu, Peacock, you name it, there's a new mm. streaming service for it. Yeah. And as, as we're waiting for the, it, you know, I don't know that we could debate about if theaters itself are coming back, but all in all, we're probably going to watch original content more likely in our homes through our devices. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I'm seeing all these streaming services, you know, just pushing out content. I mean, we saw Warner Brothers announced that every single one of their theatrical release will be on HBO Max 2 as well. Netflix mm-hmm. is doing a movie, a brand new movie every single week in 2021. Mm-hmm. Is that, with the, so many opportunities now with content creation, for you as a filmmaker, does that really excite you? Is that um, something that... Uh, you really take advantage of that opportunity and do you see that uh maybe throughout this decade that's going to keep growing and maybe we'll see some of your stuff in there well it, it excites me the fact that like so many people in the quest for new content is out there and just by basic nature of kind of common sense if you add more films more queer people of color all these things are going to make more films and the yep. same percentage and scale that happens now what i worry about is the accountability and the desire for these new things and the searching out for them and spending that effort and a little more a little bit harder time to go get these people isn't going to be necessarily put into it and so that takes i think it's a twofold thing yes we need more stuff to be made we need more money to be given to the arts more desire for content we also need more desire for accountability in the creation of the content and so there that is just the thing i think that is necessary and i there are and a lot of people can't wrap their head around it, but like it's that's more than just seeing black and brown people on a screen. How about mm-hmm. black and brown people who are creating the stories? How about black and brown people who are writing it? How about black and brown people who are getting paid? How about black yeah. and brown people who are getting these back end points? How about black and brown people who are getting made into multi millionaires off of movies? Because if a movie franchise sells of half a billion dollars, what black and brown person got paid from that? Or a person who looks like anybody who is the story is exploiting. I use exploit or exploring, I should say, because they mm-hmm. usually say, they love to say we're exploring or diving into a new world, but they're just exploiting it. They're going in it, they're mining it, they're gentrifying the fuck out of it. I'm allowed to curse on here, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you okay, can curse. Cool. Don't worry. They're like gentrifying the fuck out of it, and then they keep it pushing, and then they want to act like 
that they've done something, some favor to these people who should just be grateful to see themselves on a screen. And I'm like, no, 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 that's bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. Like, yeah. where's my bag? Like, pay me my money. Like, if you want to see me on a screen, how about pay someone who looks like me to make it fair? And like, why is the world so comfortable with allowing a cis hetero white man to tell every story that ever exists, yet not letting someone who's lived their entire life in this story to tell it? Like, what, what is it? They, they think that, that they, we can't learn filmmaking? Or is that just like, maybe the fact is that like, if there's only a certain amount of jobs options out there, if you stop finding and just giving jobs to people because they're cis hetero white men and you actually start making them have to work for their jobs, maybe a few of them won't actually have jobs anymore. And so maybe your best friend and all those people you used to be able to get onto a film just purely because you were a white man and mediocre enough to get them, they were mediocre enough to come on board, it's not gonna be allowed anymore. But then in a day, why was that okay? And why should the people who are the victims of the oppression be the people who are suffering and bearing the brunt of these overcoddled cis hetero white men who've been getting what they've wanted since the dawn of time when nobody's asking for revenge, just equitability and accountability. And I don't think that that's that much to ask for. And so right. I think, yes, I am really excited for filmmaking to be making more films. I am also excited for people to hold these people who posted all these little black squares and all these, these mm -hmm performative gestures of allyship to actually put their money where their mouth is. And I fully wholeheartedly mean that statement, put their money where their mouth is. Because I wanna see black people coming up with checks and bags and starting companies and doing things and queer people and all these different things, not just having their face and a million followers and then having to figure that out. No, I want them to be paid. And so that's kind of the thing where I'm kind of ang ang leery and hesitant to be like, waving my hands in super excitement because mm. I still ain't seen it. I know a lot of black people who are still looking for work and the people who do get to work, it's a small, tightly kept circle who yeah. it, not a lot of people are guaranteed or given entry into it. And so like, that's also gatekeeped by a bunch of white people. So like really how much freedom have we really gotten in this like ability to make content? And so I don't know. I think that there's, there's a want for it it's just it's gonna take people being honest and people being more than just grateful to be there but i also think that i'm grateful for everything i've gotten and i think don't that you can be not i don't think that being grateful and wanting what is owed to you are mutually exclusive i think you can be grateful for what's given to you but i think that you can also want what's owed to you if you did the work you should be paid for it and yeah that's it like and, you know, it's, it's a true statement that great writing, there'll always be an audience for it, no matter what and where you come from. And as you mentioned, I think, as you said, I think every specific, every, pretty much every story the white man has been unfolded. And what else is there to, to, to explore? You, you know, Sidney Lumet, yeah. the director, he, yeah. you know, amazing director from the 60s and 70s and 80s. A lot of great stories of characters overcoming obstacles and a lot of New York based stories. And he himself said, you know, I just made stories about what he just, I've just made stories about what I know as a Jewish man from New York. And he said he wants to see other people from other communities, whether people of color or Latinos or various people, it's time for their stories to be set. And as you mentioned, some of these executives and these higher ups are you know, some things are changing, but you know, there still needs to be more stories that said that. Well, like for instance, Crazy Rich Asians, obviously humongous hit. First time they had an all Asian American uh, cast it's since the nineties at that point. And then obviously this creates this boom in interest for it. Then they'll, you know, you just hear stories of people just trying to make the next version of that, but you don't need to make the next version. You need to add on to that. And mm -hmm. all types of people for, you know, whatever groups you come from. I'm sure you agree with that, don't you think? I mean, I think that people should stop waiting until it becomes financially advantageous for them to be yep. good people and start being good people because they should want to be good people and they shouldn't want to exploit people and they should want every child to look on a screen and see themselves in some kind of way, shape or form. Now, sadly, that is not the case, but I think that, us as over under discounted and discredited people proving our dollar worth is not ever a bad thing. 
to people. It sucks that that has to be a thing that has to happen. I have to prove why I am worthy of being in this coveted slot, but it is, it kind of is what it is at this point. Like, I mean, but, I, it's like ending racism and an oppression. Like what is the answer for that? I don't think I have an answer for that. Right. Do you think there is any hope though? Do you think whether it's a push to like, it's time for our voices to be heard. It's time for our stories to be showcased. And as we said, if it's good, people will be receptive to it. Do you think it's, it's a timing thing or do you think it's inevitable? There are some moments in time where films hit on such a perfect level in which they supersede this kind of racist consciousness, this kind of oppressed, conditioned response that the masses and primarily the white world has towards otherness. But those movies, why does it have to be you make an Oscar winning movie as a person yeah. of co queer person of color in order for white people to care about and see the dollar value in your movie and also let's not be forget that that movie is made by a cis hetero black man it is not a queer black uh, queer person of color so like even still in our own telling of our stories it's still not us yeah it was written by um a queer person of color but like it's it's always like we have to like take a little bit and i'm like why, why, why can't we get the same shake as like, why, I think queer people of color should be allowed to make shitty movies, just like white men are allowed to make shitty movies. Yeah. And they should be allowed to make Oscar winning movies, just like white men are allowed to make Oscar winning movies. But the problem is we don't get that same fair shake. We get, you have to make it a perfectly, perfectly nail it on the head thing. And then if all of the, the ducks align the right way, you get the right famous person, and then the world opens up and then a whole Black Lives Matter movement happens and everyone happens to be in a pandemic, then you can get a movie out there. And it's like, why does it have to be all this thing? Like, why can't it be everyone has the ability to make a movie, as allowed to make a movie, but it isn't. So, like, I mean, you know, I didn't make it. it I wish for better, but it is, it is messed up. And it is, it is a very clear, glaring oversight. And I'm so tired of people talking as if, like, yes, we've done a lot, but there is still a lot of work to do. And I think that because we're not having conversations, people are conflating that with action. We're having conversations, but now the follow through needs to be done. So like, it's not right. good enough to address a problem. You have to actually make solutions towards it. Yeah. And it's, you're right. It, you don't have to put so much pressure. It has to be an Oscar winner to finally do it. I mean, that's like the importance of what Black Panther did for the black community. They didn't have to see them as a, a character who's overcoming obstacle, obstacles and oppressed. You just see them doing amazing stuff and amazing story. Yeah, even, even like for that, like that movie is the first Marvel movie to be nominated for an Oscar. So as a black person making a movie in the sphere, you have to be so damn good that you win a fucking yeah. Oscar for a, a movie genre that has never even competed in that category. Where every, every other movie, Marvel movie, not even close, but this is the one black one we get. Mm -hmm. Like it's like well, this this need to this this perpetual conditioned thing of to make and ask everyone who's not a cis hetero white man to be fifteen times better than everybody else. And by everyone else, I mean the people who are allowed in, i.e., cis hetero white men. And still, if it's not perfect, then you don't get a chance. It's like what yeah. like. How is that, how is that, that's not, that's, that doesn't sound equitable at all or equal or fair, or okay. And like, I don't get why no one is like thinking that that sounds more okay, but I think that because it makes everyone feel uncomfortable and not nice. Oh, hey, Lilo, hey. Mm -hmm. okay. um, that they, they just want to um, act like it's not a problem, act like that enough has been done because they feel content because they got to post their little black square because they all are, um, okay, well, she's going over here now. You're going, bye-bye. Um, but they got to post a little black square and they got to do their performative allyship and they feel nice and it's great. And they got to talk to their mama on um, TikTok and post a video about them not being racist. And that's good and cute and fine and all, but that doesn't change my fucking bank account. Yeah. That doesn't change any of the queer artists I know who are not working or having trouble getting funding with their amazing films. It doesn't change the fact that people love to tweet all of their work all over the place, but not give them credit, not give them their pay. So like, that's cute that a bunch of white liberals feel okay and great and feel nice about the fact that they got to perform some allyship, but like, can you put your money where your mouth is? And that is like literally the ultimate takeaway that anybody needs because most of the problems that face any oppressed group could be solved with money. Absolutely. We need to, 
allow all the various types of stories so we can have an understanding of these different characters and where people are coming from. I, I really, I thank you for bringing, bringing this up and something I really haven't thought about too much. Um, but now, you know, I'm being very more co- cognizant that it doesn't have to only be the most perfect film to get award recognition. You just make a movie just to make a movie. And that was the point of it, telling the stories and, whether good or bad, that's just given the opportunities that so many people kill for, and it's worth it, you know? I mean, like, let's just look at, you were like the glaring inequities of the world. And I'm not comparing it to what they did versus one, and I'm a gay man, like, trust me. I have no tolerance to some toxic cis hetero white or cis hetero black man bullshit. And like, mm-hmm. look at the glaring difference between Kevin Hart and Casey Affleck, or like <laughs> Kevin um, Spacey, or Harvey Weinstein, or all these people. They can do so many messes. They literally are here raping people and getting canceled. One man said some toxic stuff in tweets a couple years ago about gay people, which mind you is toxic as fuck, but a lot of, let's be real, a lot of cis black men have somewhat toxic views on feminine, femininity, femme energy, and gayness. That's nothing new. We can address that issue, but come on. They are not the same level of issues. One is physically assaulting someone. And yet this person can do it for 25 years, okay. And the other one is like, the, the, the list goes on. Like Hattie yeah. McDaniels couldn't even go win her own damn Oscar. Like the list goes on and on. And the fact that like the institutions of like film are designed for white men have constantly said that they don't want anyone else and have constantly done everything they can to keep it just as cis or white men telling cis or white stories about women who are two dimensional and don't actually exist and aren't real. Like, and, that's, and it's cool that we all grew up on these things. We love them, but I'm so tired of white men, let's just be real, who are the gatekeepers of film, acting because they're nostalgic whims and the things that made them feel nice when they went to go see a movie with their mama or daddy or grandma or whatever, are supposed to be accepted as these masterful works when they have so many glaring oversights and are just don't, aren't rooted in the reality of the world. And anyone who's not a cis hetero white man can't help but see them. These two-dimensional women, these Black people who are peripheral characters with no subtext and storyline, who aren't well developed, they're killing off of these queer like characters and all these horrible tropes that are just problematic representations that people are asking for to be rectified and to ask for more in representation from this thing. So like the list goes on and on, but the, the problem is that like people want to feel nice and safe and happy and escapism. And I'm, I do not think that we have any more room in our inter- entertainment space for people to leave the problems of the world. We have done enough of that. So why don't we make film that can ask us the questions we need to ask ourselves, can ask us to go inward, that can cause us to go inward and pose that dialogue to better this world. But I am so tired of the excuse of being, I need to get away from it being a thing because as a black queer person, I can never step outside of this world. I don't get that reprieve. So I don't feel any guilt for some white person who feels guilty about the fact that they feel bad about it or that feels bad for the fact that they have to think all the time about these awful things to the world. Sorry, that's my reality. And that's called fair. Sorry, you got a blind pass for all these years and you're not able to work through that. But that is not my problem. That's their problem. And I'm so tired of being asked to think about it as if it is mine. I'm not doing it. And I don't pretend to do it on a podcast or to the Pope. Like, I just not do it. <laughs> so like, that's kind of where I'm at with the whole thing. And like, I'm tired of being expected that I should be anything but pissed the fuck off by it and demanding more. The change has to come. I totally yeah. hear that. Do you, do you think in this decade we're going to get closer in one way or the other? Whether it's just, we so there's new uh, distributors coming out to compete with the Warner Brothers or a Universal or a Disney, adding even more streaming services that specifically tell new filmmakers from all different backgrounds to represent their stories, or, you know, definitely open to any other ideas. Do you think that this one way or the other can change? I think it's going to change. Like I said, it takes accountability and money. Like, it's great. Well, intentions are great. Thoughts and prayers are cute. Tweets are great, but they don't affect my bank account or any of the queer creatives who I know who are not getting paid or who are not getting paid with their worth or not getting paid with their due or getting nickel and dime over bullshit that they would never dare to do to some cis hetero or a white man. So, like, I think that the real big change, the real need for change is people looking sideward because I know I'm not the one out here, like, perpetuating and causing 
queer people of color not to be paid. I'm not the one out here like screw them over and cause them to not feel safe. So like as much as it's great for, and I can come up with solutions, I think that it's people like your viewers and the audience ship and the people who love movies. It's their job to figure out what the solutions are because you know what, I have to deal with the, the world of being oppressed every day. So, and that's pretty like cumbersome. So I don't feel that it's fair for me to be asked to deal with the oppression and the problems that they create and then give them the solutions on how to solve them. I think that they can meet me halfway in doing the work. And if they actually want solutions, then maybe they can come up with some of them. So I don't actually have an answer for how to change that. But I think that, that the real change needs to come with people's attitudes around wanting to be part of the solution and seeing the value in diversity. And if they really needed to bring it down to their bottom line, you will just stop from having a glaring PR nightmare like Pepsi or any of these big, huge companies that had no, clearly not a brown person in sight when they made an ad or a post or a tweet or a concept or a whole movie. And then, and not only a brown person in sight, but a brown person who has authority to make decisions, to say something, to speak up. And it's comfortable to do that because they love to put people there, but don't give them the ability to say anything. If they don't have power, that's like, no, that doesn't work. So you have to embolden them with power. And so like, I'm not holding my breath, but I know I'm gonna damn sure do everything I can to burn this goddamn system to the fucking ground until it looks perfectly peachy and safe and fine for people who look like me, for my kids and my grandkids and all the generations to follow because I will be goddamn for sure. I will not be having this same conversation in 20 years and it will, it will look a lot different. That is for sure because I, the fact that I've gone 26 years of my life before I ever saw anyone who looked on a screen that looked on a screen that looked like me is not okay. Not okay. That's fucked up. That's not allowed. That's just not okay. This is 2020, 2021 even. Come on. Really? Really? Like the fact that we have first black anything still is ridiculous. Yeah. The first woman, if anything, <clears throat> is fucking ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Women make up 50% of the fucking world, 52% of the world, actually. And we have our first woman anything, like, come on, there's no one, like, what, what? So I'm, mm -mm, nah, nah, they can go find some solutions, but what they need to do is go find some and value the diversity, value it, understand it brings an asset, it's a different angle of looking at it, but I'm so tired of having to convince, let's be real white people, and just the world of why it is beneficial to have diversity, like, and it's just so insulting to be like, oh, like, I'm not as good as someone because I'm, I'm different. Okay, cool. And I'm not a white man. Okay, cool. So like, I have to convince you why I should be worthy. I'm like, what? As you said, we, we value diversity because that's just part of life. It, we were just, we go, you know, whenever, whenever you enter this world, whether it's in the 90s, 2020s, 1800s, the year t three, we've had all the people in the world, you know, various places in history. And what's important and why having diversity is, in, is, is key is because, you, as you said, the original stories are brought out. The, um, as you said, it's, it's just, it's cool when you have a show like uh, Rami for the first time, introducing, mm -hmm. uh, um, introducing a Muslim family and characters, again, a not mm -hmm. a story of being, being oppressed. He's just a normal millennial person who deals with the same stuff millennials deal with. Yeah, you because don't have our entire identity isn't linked to these identifiers that come after our names. They're like, well, we're people, and then we have identifiers. I am O and H done. Man, gay, femme, black, queer, all those things come after me, but I'm still a person first. Yeah. And so people want to see themselves on screens. I'm like, I'm so damn tired of seeing movies about gay people dealing with being okay with being gay. I don't give up. I do give a fuck, but we are so much more than that. Yeah. Cool. You come out now. What do you do with the rest of your fucking life? Like, exactly. can I see that in a movie? Can I see what the rest of your life looks like? Or how about the problems that aren't just linked to the way my identity is not solely boiled down to me being oppressed. Yes, it bugs the fucking piss out of me all day long sometimes, but I am a full, whole, round human being outside of my oppression. Now, if movies could also understand that, that would be great. And if white people could understand that I have an identity outside of how they feel about me and my life and how it interacts with them, that would be amazing because I don't spend my entire day designing it around what they think. Right. Contrary to what they seem to think. And that's why it's important to push those 
writers of different backgrounds. You push those producers of them because they know the exact story. It's like when you, now it's one of the things that has to, one of the things, for instance, um, when we talk about disabled people and you hire a regular person, but they have to transform in a disabled look. There's so many actors out there who, you know, whether they're wheel, they are disabled for whatever happened in their life that put them in that position, but they're still great actors and still talented, but you don't have to pat yourself on the back for putting them in there. You put them in because, well, they can act you the role. You wanted to tell the story and you need authenticity. So if you want to authentically tell a story, sounds like you should get someone who authentically occupies the space. Yeah. What the fuck do I know about having, I, I, one of my producers I work with is disabled. He's in a chair and he's mm-hmm. got other disabilities and stuff like that. And there's some shit that he has taught me about life and understanding about shit that I would have never fucking thought about in my life. Like we were, we're working on a project that's about, is around sexuality and disability. Mm-hmm. And so, and people like to, infanti- infantilism in like disabled community is really common because they like to reduce you because, oh, you're thought of as like, damage as he puts it so therefore you can't be like a sexual being because in our minds we can't become comfortable with this different form being yeah. sexualized and so we were working on something around that i had known nothing about that i am a fully able body person i have asthma but that's about where i stop at and anxiety but like come on like that's like that's, that's nothing like brian's been in his chair in chair in his entire life like and so like that is just a different perspective. He has shown me so many different things and taught me so many different things because he's like, I, I've never experienced that. But I also have become a changed person because of having Brian in my life. Like yeah. literally just because it's simply just like the shit that we pull on people is hilarious. Like, and I have <laughs> changed about what I think about disabled people I, in, intrinsically because of that exposure. And film can give people the courage and the ability to walk in worlds and lives they would never dare to dream about. That's what's beautiful. So why wouldn't you want to give that to people? Yeah. I've never, I have never experienced life in my adult consciousness from three feet high. Brian has experienced his entire life from three feet high. Yeah. And there's still nothing That is the difference in our perspectives. Exactly. Our complete difference in our perspectives. People don't look at Brian and pay, pay attention. He's in the room. He is always observing, always watching people. Yeah, and I'm sure we have to look at that person who Brian is. You don't define him by his disability. You define him as the person and how he contributes to the He's story. With it, brilliant. He's fucking brilliant. Literally brilliant. Like literally brilliant. He is one of the like in t- in depth detail person on structure if you're a lot if you i love the fact that he's the type of person it's like the yes and philosophy and improv mm-hmm. you tell him what you want to do he doesn't say that's a bad idea he says if you want to do that then this is how you should, i think would be an effective way of getting there that is so much more helpful than telling me what i can't do because you tell me what i can't do i'm gonna say oh fuck you i'm gonna watch me i'm gonna show you what i can do telling me how to get where i want is helpful that is helpful notes and I think that he is just a brilliantly brainy resource that I love to death. And so like all I have to say is that's a, a difference in diversity that people don't oftentimes think about, but like, that's not a, something that like you ultimately, like it's helpful. And so ultimately I'd say all that to say is just the fact that like diversity is about having the most wide scoping views on of p- viewpoints of people, not just yeah. putting a black person in the room, but like, do you have women in your room? Do you have people who occupy this space? Especially if it's relevant to your topic and your content. Yeah, it, like, it just helps the audience more if you have people from different communities, you know, telling a story together, and offer different ideas. Like one of the criticisms from Saturday Night Live is quite frankly, the writer, the writing staff's but really white. They're almost all at white one point. Very white, very male. Very white, very male. So how can we make the show relevant if you're just do writing for what a white male is doing? You need to have, you need to have people, you need to have people from the LGBT community. You need to have more women. You need to have people of color because they are what's going to attract your audience and bringing you in. And And also just going to cover your ass, like cover your ass. If if nothing more, if every white person left this conversation and took away that having diversity covers their ass, I'd be fine. (laughs) I'd consider myself a win for a credit to my race and a win at a big level because then at least they would just get us in the room just to cover their ass, which that can work on changing their mind, but at least they're getting us in the room and getting us paid. Like, so yeah. like, 
and like it's just fucking annoying it's like it's annoying it's like please respect me as a person and then it's like okay like don't get mad about it okay cool so i'm not really mad that you treat me like i'm not a person but like i uh, like it's a catch-22 but that's a whole other rant and that's why and then you just have more people from different audiences coming to the same work because well they all came together to write like that yeah that's those two things uh fingers crossed owen seriously yeah I really I'll push do. it through, and I want to hop on that as I want to hop on that wave too, and really push it as someone as a, as a mixed race person and who's yeah, had yeah. you know the very it's not identity crisis, it's really not, but it's just always been unique for my um, situation. You know, I've seen worlds, different worlds. You know, it's it's just funny when you have yeah. like my dad's a my dad's a person of color, and my mom is a half white, half Spanish lady. And I've seen, it's funny when the times we would have in a pre-COVID world come together, you have just different t- skin tones together. Mm-hmm. It was fun for me, but it really didn't take until, honestly, Obama getting uh, elected as him as also person of color, but also has a white mother and helping the rise of biracial, of biracial angels, as I call it. And now seeing those different stories, but I could understand it, but then when I have friends, like whether it's my white friends from home feeling confused and saying all these different things, it's just like, no, it's just where I come from, what I am. And it's an interesting world. It's not that different. You don't have to be uncomfortable about it. We're just here yeah. together. And I do think the identity crisis of like mixed race people, people is very a real thing as much as it's discredited, discredited oftentimes by both races. Cause it's like, oh, well you're gorgeous <laughs> if you're by the white people and the people who you from the other larger culture are like, yeah, but you're like, what they do, colorism's a thing. So like, shut the fuck up, it's not a problem. But yeah. there is this sense of identity because you're forced to choose. And it's not a thing that most people can understand or identify with, that they can wrap their head around be having the, given the option to choose, even though you don't really get the option because the outside societal world decides it for you. That's really yeah. real. But, um, but yeah. you're right. I totally agree with it. And we, sh- we can't be defied by that. We're just the people part. And that's why I really identify with the people part. Cause you know, I've been assumed of all different races and I, you know, I write the two or more races part when I do my application, but I'm just still proud of it. I love my family as a whole, no matter what sides. And because I've been fortunate enough early on to see different perspectives and families and different stories, mm-hmm. I really want to make that push for it because, well, I started living it and, until I had conscious memories. And now as we could, as we start this fight to be more open to it and to have more of these storytellers, executives, and, you know, most importantly, the fans and audiences to push for what they want. That's just something easy for me to to support and transition to, you know? Well, I appreciate that if I have made you more of a convert or a fighter in the good cause of or open your eyes i am more than happy no you seriously I, th- I thank you for that and you know like as we're both in the production world and you know one of the things when i've worked at these big conglomerates i was it was mostly all white kids mm-hmm. working up there whether they got in through nepotism whether they got in through you know some valiant school with it and it was just it was just unique it uh Almost like, did you did you have people, you know, again, I'm more of a mixed person, but, you know, did you have other minorities here just to even it out? This is why, again, you need to have more of us together because it brings us all of the places we've come from to help support your stories and have more audience. And at the end of the day, it's that money. More people come, you'll get more money. So it was just always a, a weird thing for me. And, and when I was in that room with mostly white people, I wanted to have more people, whether mixed or um, people of color or coming from other backgrounds. I wanted to have more of a diverse room than feeling like the elephant in the room for the few of Mm -hmm. us that were there. So that's why that type of fight and push is important to me. That's super real. Well, yeah. Uh, Did you have anything else? I feel like we've gone all over the world now. (laughs) Oh, man, I, I could go all day. But yeah, that was a really good start. So... Why don't we get it to your music, Owen? Oh, I forgot about my music. Oh, yes. Um, music stuff. I make music. It is all over the place at times, but it is a lot of feelings. Yes. So, I've seen you sing. I've seen you move around. 
one of my favorite tracks of yours specifically in is Inside when you teamed up with Tom Yanks, which is an awesome yeah. name, by the <laughs> way. But how's that, how's that coming along? You know, it's uh, your music, I find it very experimental or... Um, it's very experimental. Ignore the, um, <laughs> what you see on camera, I'm moving. No worries, no worries. But yeah, it's very, like I said, very experimental, very, a lot of good production in that. I'm just wondering how um, that process has been and have you been able to find performing in, you know, this COVID world? Have you been able to really push that music? How is that going? Um, it is going. It is, um, I had a show not too long ago for my birthday at my parents' house where I kind of had a socially distant thing and they were on the yeah. other side of the glass. Everyone was and I was inside performing through the glass because they had this like wall of windows. And so that was cool. And finding new avenues to incorporate filmmaking and performance together has been really cool. So I'll be releasing that kind of live performance stuff slowly but surely as I roll out this upcoming album this coming year. So there's a lot of cool music stuff that's on the horizon and a lot of cool like fun collabs and visuals. And I'm working on a really cool music film project that can't say too much about right now but like mm -hmm. it's really cool and so i don't know i think i'm really just fighting the way that all these art forms can collide and so um yeah but if you want to check out my music you can check it out at spotify and that's yes. o h d all capital letters and you can see it um yeah it's on all major platforms and tiktok so if you want to make a tiktok dance to my music like i would support that wholeheartedly <laughs> um but um I do that too. yeah i um yeah, I just think that um, it's finding new ways of getting music out there because you can't really rely on live performance and that one-to-one -one artist audience in-person interaction that you would get beforehand. So it's a little different, but I think that it's kind of, I'm glad I work in film and know film and production well because they're instantly beneficial and advantageous to any creative now in this day and age because we do have to now document our art and then put it out there, yeah. which was moving towards that anyway, but it's just interesting to see and how you do lose a little something when it's not live, I do feel. How do you feel the industry has been treating you um, recently or other performers just like you? Do you think, um, do you think it's about moving well? Is it going the right direction? Is it, you know, do they have similar accountability issues that the film industry needs to? How has that been... Um, how is that? How have you been maneuvering it industry wise? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I think that racism and misogyny and homophobia and transphobia are problems with America and the world in general. So there's still going to be obviously problems in the music industry as well, yep. if not sometimes maybe more so. But I do think the music industry is a little more open and to weirdness and out thereness and otherness that if your music slaps, they don't really care. And weirdness and otherness does a little better. And so it's interesting in how in my feel, it feel like exploration and stepping kind of back in a way for a bit from in front of the camera stuff, except for my own work I'm making doing with my music and stuff. Right. Um, I really got a second to step back and look at and examine who I was and like explore these concepts of gender, gender expression, all this stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I found like my music and the creating the artist that is odd was helpful in doing that. And so I gave me an outlet to do that. And I like, I, I enjoy little things like having my nails done and mm -hmm. wearing makeup and dresses and sparkly outfits. I think it gave me a place to be that wild, crazy, reckless self. So that way, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel like I was being a character. I felt like that was my authentic version of myself and like a yeah. heightened almost kind of way. And then I could still, now I think I'm really getting back into this whole create, like acting in front of the camera whole world because I think I found like, I've got that kind of getting myself out in a way, the wildness that's like me controlling what I'm saying and not putting it on a character or putting it on a character someone else gives me. It's, it's, yeah, it's a very interesting way of feeling because it's also like you have the music. It is, it's different than even like being on a screen. It's like you have the music and then you put it out there and then everyone has their own individual experiences with it, but you're not there for it. So it's like, Whereas I'd only performed music in live performance before. Now, like, recorded music, it's like, like, I had someone who was in South Africa who reached out to me and was like, I love your song, Voodoo. It is a bop. 
And I was yeah. like, bruh, I have never met you before. I didn't even know my, someone in South Africa was listening to my music. <laughs> the biggest place that my music streams for, for one of my songs is Mumbai. I have All never right. been to Mumbai before. Mumbai and then one of my songs is Lonely does really well is in Germany. Um, never been to Germany before either. Could have never guessed it. I wasn't there when they did it. I wasn't there when they were listening to it with their friends or getting drunk or doing whatever, smoking pot or whatever the heck they were doing to it. I wasn't there for it, but yet they have such a visceral response to it. And they also have this innate kinship with you in kind of in a way that I find super interesting and intriguing just because they feel kind of this attachment to you because as if you were, your energy or essence was there for this moment that meant something to them. That when they were driving down the highway enjoying themselves. And so part of me wishes I could be there in those moments because they're so excited about these moments of what your music did at that moment in time. Yeah. And those moments really give me life because I'm like, oh, fuck, right. I did this for a reason. This is great. And someone really appreciates this. But also they kind of make me sad just because I can't be there when they're experiencing it. With Like, I wish I could be there for the first time. Like, I love it when I'm performing live and people can hear my music for the first time and they're there and they're watching it and then they get to go and really fall in love with it. Now, don't get me wrong. I love when people can find it on a play- playlist and they can see these cool things. I love that. I love that too. But yeah. just getting to be there, really, it's kind of the selfishness in me, but getting to really be there right when it happens. I love that. I love that feeling. And I, the, It's weird. I just got started performing my music live when the pandemic happened. So mm-hmm. it was kind of nuts. Showing yeah, your productivity you, and showing your talents. It, it really hit somebody. It really made it impact. And that ha- that's the best, again, you know, I, I know you say storytelling a lot, but I really think the world rules are, it spins because it's just different stories and whether you're living yeah. them now or uh, reflecting on them in the past. But you, your music, it, it shows that if you can make an impact on one person, you can do it for so many others. And at the end of the day, you as the creator, you as the artist, you're doing it for yourself. Mm-hmm. And, can, you know. You can lo- you can't love someone else unless you love so uh, love yourself. So I'm sure that's the same with your music. I'm sure that's Facts. the same with your following, and that's most important with you. So I admire that. I admire that. What um, what do you do? You have any plans? You know, as this hopefully, as we continue to get vaccinated, and hopefully, hopefully by the end of 2021, this pandemic, whatever they have to do to be declared over. Again, I'm not an expert. I'm just following science and wishing for the best but what do you plan what do you have planned for your music like performing wise once the pandemic's over you can have you can get um more chances to perform do you plan on seeing uh, out there hopping yeah, up in a bus I, and bouncing around while think, also creating films too i think i'm going to i'd love to go on tour with someone i would love to play festivals i really want to do that yeah. next and I think everyone's been like, yeah, you have really good festival music. And New Orleans is such a popular festival place. For sure. They're like, oh, I would love to play festivals. I would love to sign to a distributor, like someone just to push the music out there and like a bigger label to a bigger label to distribute with not less to sign with them because I can make the music on my own. Um, and then um, I think really, really, I just want to like keep making music, run them streams up hit a couple million streams get that bag you know yeah really get to collaborate more with other artists and music wise and just really get to i'd love to work with real like like studio musicians and musicians and get to like pay musicians to come in because a lot of stuff right. it's like if it's something like on oh, it's either me or a friend doing it but i'd love to like have a string section and like do a big like live huge big production guys to have the money to do that so oh. i'd love to do that like i'd love to i'm such a fucking dramatic over the top ass bitch so like i feel like if i had money oh god if i had money to put on a show oh just peep that jimmy fallon or letterman or whoever late night show that i do where they're like oh this is their first tv appearance peep that shit that's to me fire it's gonna be well gorgeous started. it's gonna be gorgeous i got a letterman poster right here i love letterman because he was somebody who um next to eddie murphy michael jordan all the various but I like Letterman because he gave a lot of people chances when they really didn't, whether it was a uh, talking heads got popular from them and the yeah. various stand-up comedians. That's yeah. what, that's awesome. And that's one of the, one of the things I want to do with this show and to showcase artists and music. But um, yeah. yeah, I would, I, I'll, I'll play your music and intros and cold opens and to show it off. I, I really mean it. Um, yeah, I do it too. I'm 
about to drop some cool stuff that really, I feel like in this new stuff, I really found myself as an artist. And I really felt like I knew what I was doing kind of in a way. Yeah. And I think it sounds like I know what I'm doing, this new stuff that's about to come out. So I'm excited for the world to have it. And it's kind of weird that like, I've been jamming to it for like <laughs> a year or so, like, and listening mm-hmm. to it and creating it. But like, I'm excited for the world to have it because it's really, like, I listen to my own music. Like, I work out to my music. Like it's <laughs> that's how you interesting. Know. That's how I know. I said I had a good song if I could work out to my music, and I love, love working out to my music. I love listening to my music. Like I genuinely listen to my music. So if nothing more, I have one fan, and that's me. So and my mother. So <laughs> <laughs> funny you say that because I feel the same way with the podcast. That's how I feel. I knew like I could really do this because I genuinely listen to my podcast, whether it's just to take notes on myself, it to make sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I need improvements, which happens all the time. Like already, you know, we're in the early forties with the show, but if you listen to the first 10 episodes, they're completely different. Just yeah, you get better at things. You get better at things the more you do them. And it's just, I love the medium with podcasts and radio in general. They really coincide. Mm -hmm. I don't don't listen as much radio as the podcast, but I still listen to it. But it just, (laughs) it's just, I love hearing my guests too and reflecting on these conversations. It's great. And, And please, please, if you need any promotion with this, as I told you, this audience keeps growing um, yeah hey i'm all about there's no bad that. press there's no bad press i'm like promo that shit up yo run go check my instagram it's at o n h o n h period done d-u-n-n-e that's o-w-e-n-h period d-u-n-n-e that's my insta yes go peep that peep those streams it's odd on all platforms i think apple music is o capital o lowercase h the capital d it's something weird on apple music because it like screwed me over but everywhere mm-hmm. else, it's O H D all capitals, and that's what will appear on the stuff. But like, I think if you type it into like Apple Music, it gets weird. But like, okay. if you just type in odd, it comes up. So Thank yeah, God. like I'm, I am the new. I'm really excited for the new album. I'm, I'm it's been a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat and tears and a lot of money. <laughs> Not a lot please. of money, but it's costing me because I paid the money for this one. I was like, I'm gonna do this the right way. Yeah, oh, please, please. Mind, yeah. When your album comes out, we'll do some promotion for it. I promise. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you some stuff. And I have some. I think. Yeah, it's just you can tell that there's a lot of flaws that I wasn't afraid of hiding. I think in the album, and I think I that it. um that is yeah. I can't wait. I I want. I hope I see you in the Coachellas, the Bonnaroo's, the. Uh, I would love to play you? Coachella. That is a hmm. goal of mine. Coachella and the cover of GQ are two goals of mine. I also want to play Jazz Fest, the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Festival. Yeah. I want to play that. And that's, I think that's a more, I mean, that, like, those are things that, like, now it's crazy to think about. But my friends who have also played the, the festivals are like, that's doable for you right now. So, yeah. I don't know. It, it's a bridge. You, you bridge on your way to go up to that headlining act. It's all, there was all times where the various artists at first were, you know, in humbling beginnings. And then, you know, they're there where they are because of the hard work and push. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I think that's kind of where I'm at right now. But um, beautiful. Yep, I'm just um trucking along, <laughs> trying to have fun and enjoy life. I too it. You, I think one thing we could both agree is we have to just remember we are still really young. We still have a lot of push. I could debut mm-hmm. millions of celebrities who found that was it was meant to be later in life your roger danger peter nyong'o is like the mm-hmm. homie like she came out the gate swinging with an oscar yeah she was like i'm an a-list celebrity you've never heard of me before this and now i'm an a-list celebrity so wow and i'm like that's goals Josh gambino's also goals too but um oh doing, yes yeah. it, i, I think it, it, those people have genuine confidence too they like yeah, you said they're just you could like brilliant that. people and they're educated that's the thing that people don't realize about both of them they're educated Lipity has a Yale. Yeah, she's from Yale. Josh Gambino has a master's degree in screenwriting. Mm. So, See? power, power to the artist. Exactly, because it's there. Can right. I ask you one thing? You yeah, go for it. You've been to so many places, Owen. I know you went to Columbia College to get your master's degree. I know, obviously, we met at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. Mm-hmm. And you're about to New York, LA, you're from New Orleans, from all the various places in this country, whether you're there to promote work, to do work, what are like some of your favorite places in this country to, you know, really showcase yourself? 
I love New Orleans. There's nothing like a New Orleans audience. And people just come to New Orleans and the magic of it just permeates your soul. Yeah. Like it just, it just, it changes people. And it's nothing like having a crowd of people who are having a great time and enjoying themselves and drinking. And they're just there, they're listening to your music. And you're just like, yes. You're like this whole bar of people is jamming to my music. Mm -hmm. We're having a good time. And it's just, it's totally invigorating. And I think there's nothing like it. And it just feels like home. Like it really just has this energy. Like there's nothing like a crowd in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. They just are like, I remember I got to perform for Jazz Fest. I was a dancer. And even just the crowd, it's just, there's just this air, this buzz in the air that New Orleans crowds just give you at their festivals. It's just like, it is intoxicating. It's so intoxicating. It's so much love. It's the love. It's the really the love and the reverence and respect for the craft that New Orleans people, they really respect art and then they have a reverence for it. I think that is something that really speaks to my soul. I think it speaks to a lot of why I create and why I view this as such a, like a religious process. Yeah, but yeah. You, you, it really is true. We're a product of our environments. I really mm -hmm. do it's stuff like that. You know, is there next to New Orleans, is there any other um, cities or places that give you that special effect or special place in your heart to perform? Not uh, okay. Well, in America, yeah, I love Siena. Siena, okay. the Siena Jazz Festival is like a, on the list of my places I'd love to perform. I'd love mm -hmm. to get to go back to Siena. It's an amazing, magical place. I love Korea. I want to get on Korea, Paris. London, I'd love to go to. I'd love to spend some time in South Africa because I found out that I some people who like my music out there. Yeah. Searching so for knows? Sugar Man. You could be searching like, for Sugar Man. Have you ever I'm seen not. that? What's Sugar Man? Oh, it was pretty much there was this. It's an amazing documentary. I mm. really, really recommend it. It's just pretty much there was this. It was like this folk singer in the 70s and 80s oh, who was like, yeah. who was nothing in America, like with all due respect to him, but South Africa, he was like a god like how people will revere like a bob dylan they revered this guy oh so, hell yeah i'm trying to be that person like, it like, seems I'd like you're on that path that. i'd really love to blow up in like europe and then like come back and like america people be like holy shit and i'm like yeah i've been here yeah yeah okay. <laughs> but also my music is very european like it usually tracks in like euro house kind of yeah. vibes or euro queer pop is usually where the lines of landing on playlists and stuff so mm -hmm. i'm down i don't know we'll see but um i don't know all right, cool, cool. What was it like to go to school in Columbia, Chicago? I mean, we we that's as especially that program, whether it's like Atlanta White or um other people like that starting to, you know, come out of that school and you're part of that alumni. What is it? How is that? that shit? Oh, I fucking hated that shit. And so do so many people like me. If you're not a cis hetero white man, oh okay, I won't say hetero, but if you're not anything but a white man, you're probably not gonna like that place because they have not really moved into the times. Interesting. And I've been very vocal about that, as I get why their notable celebrities are black queer people, but um, they don't really know how to teach or support or understand stories about black queer people and so the fact that they kind of make you think that you're kind of crazy and the fact mm -hmm. that you don't know what you're doing because you're telling a story that they don't get and they can't, it's outside their wheelhouse or understanding of experiences of life so they act like it's not real and i'm like well no that's just not used you're not used to that but that is a real thing in the world so it's kind of annoying it's very stupid it's stupid and almost insulting to your intelligence because I have a teacher in one breath say, wow, Owen's here. We don't, I guess I'm going to teach class today. And fully means that. And lets me continue giving notes on everyone's scripts. And then mm -hmm. the next breath class, the teacher tells me that she thinks I don't understand story structure and I'm getting a 44. So That's some those aren't adding up. And then on the next breath, you can literally teach my film as part of your graduate curriculum. Wow. So I'm confused. It doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense. And the only thing I can add up is that maybe the brown skin and the twang of my gay ass tone were a little bit too much for them to understand the life experiences that I have because it's not because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and it's taken me a long term time to have the confidence to know to say that and to go through all these places to know that I have more than qualified to be here, but it is not because I did not know what I'm doing. 
Yeah, that's so, that's what I like to hear. That you know to take it in your own hands and not let these people bring you down. No, that, that I'm not gonna believe these white people and let them convince me that I do not know what I'm doing. And yeah. they don't know what they're doing, and they're scared because I do know what I'm doing. Yet I can do it, and I'm 20 years or 15 years younger than them, and I look like I come from a place that doesn't look like it should be coming from. And I get all those things, but that's for them to deal with. Like I said earlier, that is not my problem. Cool. I I get. Yeah, and I hear that. I really respect that a lot. Don't let anyone tell you you're not a good storyteller when you are. No, don't let anyone tell you that your story is not valid because it's not been seen before or because they can't imagine it or because they can't imagine what you've been through or they don't know enough about the world except for the white world to know about what it's like to be anything other than white in America. Like, that is, and that's the thing that sucks is being a queer or queer person of color or anything other than a white man in these worlds is you have to constantly wave things to the guise of, is this just not accurately communicated and clearly communicated? Or is this just not, they don't get it because they can't. They, they have this, this barricade because it's not white and cis and male. So those are questions you kind of have to ask yourself all the time. And it's, mm-hmm. it's annoying that as a, a person, you have to ask that. It's annoying that sure. I have to second guess that. I'd have to put in that extra legwork. That's annoying. Could you tell us some awesome films from black queer from black queer filmmakers that we can tune in and look for just oh to be god. entertained most of all? Yes. Oh my god. So okay, if you're talking about docs, one of my absolute favorite docs, and I'm biased, but it is an amazing <laughs> doc, is this doc called Peer Kids. It is Peer by kids. this amazing filmmaker, Elegance Bragg, and, and his producing partner and husband, um, Chester. Um, and they are it is a Gorgeous, gorgeous doc. It explores a black trans woman in New York living um, as she kind of struggles with the societal and systemic problems that she faces in the world. It's a brilliant thing. I literally like, I've never seen so many white people sit in a room and cry about some black (laughs) trans people. It literally is, if you need anything to make you care or understand why black trans women are important and valid, and need to be heard and given accountability to tell their own stories and infrastructure and space to be who they are. It is an incredible documentary to watch and you should most definitely add it to your list of things. I think it's coming out soon. It's in the festival circuit. I saw it at a festival and I thought I've seen it a couple times now. It is, it is fucking right. brilliant. It is like literally the Paris is burning of the modern era. It is literally incredible. And nope. then, uh, wait, what? Uh, I was just going to add, uh, I'll let you do your suggestion, but I have a great suggestion too. Oh, yeah, go what, for it. What, you know what an awesome move? This is a feature that features black trans women, and it really is just an awesome story, again, of environment, overcome obstacles. Is Tangerine, Sean Baker. Tangerine. Okay, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen it yet. It's on my list because it's shot on an iPhone. And that yeah, was completely my, on my an bride. iPhone. For my graduate thesis, I was looking at using an iPhone for it because I kind of just liked that idea. Um, and I know Apple was looking to partner with some creatives to do some stuff, and, but um, I, but I decided against it. And so I was look, it was on the list of movies to watch and I, everyone's always like, it's black and queer, so you'd love it. And I'm like, I know I will. I just haven't had a chance to sit down and watch it, but I'm gonna watch it. So like, yeah, maybe oh, that's what you want to do while I'm sitting in New York. Please tell me what you I, I Do you have Hoopla by any chance? I don't have Hoopla. I don't so, know what that is. So Hoopla is just another streaming service. It's, oh, okay, cool. it's uh you get it through your library actually and uh okay. that's where i found it there or if you want to pay the four bucks i was going to read you my review but it has spoilers in it so i don't want to uh okay give that away but yeah, um tangerine's great i'm trying to think of another queer black filmmaker and that's the hard part is there aren't that many like yeah. i know of him because he's a friend like and makes incredible films and we met at a, a film festival but why do i have to be infiltrating the highest level of institutions of filmmaking in order to find a damn capable, amazing black queer filmmaker. Like, why do I have to jump through those hoops? They should be available yeah, to people. Exactly. So, like, I mean, another one is Patrick Ian Polk is a pretty good filmmaker, I must admit. I love his some of his work. He also is helpful. He did, did a show called Noah's Ark, but he really has this movie called Black Birth, a narrative that's really actually quite incredible. I've heard Noah's Ark. Um, I think that, that I think that Lena Waithe does a lot to help advance the culture, I'll say, in creating yep. content, so I'll give her credit for that. Great for the I Chai think, and Master of None. Yeah, the Chai is great. Um, and so I think, um, and the things that she's created from that, from after um, parlaying her 
platform into things, I think it's been helpful. I think Janae Mock is, um, Janae Mock is really amazing. I think she's an amazing force as far as writing and pushing trans black women forward, making sure trans black women are at the forefront of their stories and not these peripheral people. And, and then also the care in which she gives to these stories. I think Janae, Janet Mock is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, amazing asset to the world. All the women from Pose, to be quite honest, um, yeah. all very amazing assets. I honestly think a younger icon, I think that's a great asset, is Zaya Wade. I think that her transitioning inside of a family that is Black royalty, and so many people, uh, like, her father is a, what could potentially be a toxic Black man, and is so accepting and understanding. And I think seeing that is a very healing thing for the Black community around queerness. So I think I give her her props and her credit. And I don't care if you're fucking 14. She has a platform and a bunch of yeah. eyes looking at her. So it is as much of a stakes and scary, if not more so scary for her than it is for any other grown ass man coming out or a woman coming out or them or they or she or anyone in between there because there's so many different forms and facets of expressing oneself in these dumb ass boxes of boy and girl and all the <laughs> stupid subscribed gender roles that have to go with them. But yeah. um. It's time to be entertained. You'll be entertained, informed, and inspired either way. Yeah. But the sad truth of the matter is that I don't, I can't give you that many queer Black filmmakers because there just aren't that many that get the space to do it. Yeah. And it sucks. It sucks that I have to list the ones that are, not sucks because they make amazing content, but it, it sucks that the only way I know of them are people who I know from working with them or being yeah. in the middle of their world or their personal friends who have to make amazing work that I met in these like, that, that's unfortunate. And so the goal is to give more people the space to do that. But I mean, I guarantee you, I've named three more queer black filmmakers than most people can knew even existed. Right. We need so, to make it on a mainstream level in the sense to just get in that influence, not just the mainstream, yeah. just the mainstream, but to do it simply because they're talented and who cares yeah. what, what they are, you know, who cares where they come from or background. I mean, obviously it's admirable, but you shouldn't base that to make that a special emphasis. You do it because they're just a talented storyteller. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like seeing the value in it, but it really comes down to white people having to ask themselves those hard questions and black people about queerness and all these other things about who they are, and what they're really uncomfortable with and address those things because you don't like the reason these things don't get funded is because the people don't like these people like they're still out here killing us so like what's our hope to be given paychecks on movies if you're out here killing us if we're still fighting for our right to live to not be shot by people who are employed by our tax dollars like that is ridiculous so there's no hope of us having respect on an artistic front if you can't respect our basic human needs and rights and rights need to live and breathe and not have be stamped out and trampled by government employees. Like the inequities of the world are so glaring yeah. that like, I can't, I'm not surprised people have trouble respecting artists of oppressed groups when they have trouble respecting the oppressed groups lives. And don't help because it's mainstream. Help because it's the right thing right. to do. Right. Stop helping because it's trendy. Your allyship yeah. is trendy. That's cute. But like, can I can I have happiness and the whole human existence? Be nice. Yeah. Don't do don't do it to put it on your social media. Just do it. Don't do, I mean? Don't take a picture and post it. Do it because again, Just it's the right it. thing to do. Just do as it. Spike Lee has right here. It's it's like you as a white person, your uncomfortability could be the difference in someone dying or not. Yeah. So like, just be a little uncomfortable because that person's got it way worse. And that's how it, it's the tough, it's the hard road, but that's the only way to get a genuine change out of it. And it's not that hard. It's just like the fair road. Why yeah. do you get to have an easy pass when I have to fear for my life? Yeah. Okay. It is. Yeah. A... So yeah. Uh, just uh, hope yeah. for more. Can I, you know, one thing I want to ask you, Owen uh, there was, I just want to confirm this, if this is true or not, about okay. an urban legend regarding you. Oh my God, urban legend. There are urban legends around me already? Shit. <laughs> I'm scared. I'm always scared when people say about me when I'm not around. Shoot, go for it. <laughs> is it true at one point in your life was the talented, world-renowned artist Frank Goshen, is it true that he was at one point your babysitter? Yes, yes. Frank Ocean was my babysitter 
Although at the time I knew him as Chris Bro because he was my neighbor. <laughs> yeah. And he used to carry around a little composition notebook that had his lyrics in it. And I remember he told me he was going to be a singer. No and I remember way. I was like, bruh, is that even a real job? I was like, because <laughs> he's 30, he was 13. He was five years old. So I was like, hey, it's time. I'm like, bro, that's not a real job. How you can you make money as a singer? Who, how do you do that? That's not even real. That's not even loud. Like, who, only people like on Disney Channel and shit like that can be singers. Like, that's not real. <laughs> and you, my neighbor. So how the fuck are you going to do that? Is what I'm thinking. I mean, lo and behold, the, a credit to never telling people what's possible. Like, or what's not possible because he's huge. Yeah. And that is so, and he's a queer black man, just like me, from my block. And just that's why, like, I don't think I could have believed it was possible potentially as much as I could if I had not seen that. Like, he did it. So it's doable. I yeah. cannot say, like, now I know it's at least possible. I didn't even know it was possible before. Well, Nas X has the number one song in the entire world for a long time. And he's a gay black dude who paints his nails and experiments with gender roles. I didn't know that was possible to be doing that until I saw it happen. And now I know it's doable. Yeah, and this is entertaining music. How, whether you're pyramids and uh, yeah. you know, Novocaine. I mean, I love Chino Orange. Not, not to mention they do they do those songs have done really well on the charts, amassed a lot of money and yeah. acclaim and stuff. So no one can say one they can't say that it's not been done before. But two, they can't say it hasn't been done to a, a massive amount of success. So it's like, what is your reason for not letting me do this thing? Are you scared that you're gonna have another big, huge, massive slam dunk success on your hands? <laughs> is that what you're worried about be. because yeah, they shouldn't be afraid yeah. do it because they're just talented and they have something to say right it's like every time you give black people some shit we like or and queer people some shit and black queer people in general uh we slay that shit out the fucking ballpark so why are we afraid to do it people don't like change there was like a change. good time that but now so. change and progression is the thing to do and be yeah that's real. That's real. Well, how about that? Frank Ocean at one point, well, to you know, as Chris, I, I, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce the last name. It's bro. bro. Just bro, Chris Bro. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that, that, that's just, that's fascinating. How about that? Yeah. Did he ever perform? Did he ever perform when you were babysitting or no, was like, hey, check no, this out? Or No, bro. No, just, bro. I mean, he was 13 at the time. So I don't even know if he had started performing or whatever. He was a 13 year old who wrote lyrics now. Like. But hey, that still counts. So and it really got him to be Frank Ocean. So, like, I'm not knocking yeah. nothing. So, but I mean, okay. I'm, and my heart goes out to his family because I know he just lost his brother and stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. So, you or heard that. brother. Yeah, I, they had a car accident. It was a couple months ago, but still. Okay. So, my, he definitely got my thoughts and prayers, and I understand how hard that is. And I Absolutely. am intrigued to see how he turns that pain into art because um, that's a big one. But, um, yeah. You take, your, you know, take your time because we're ready when uh, you are. No, I can't wait to see what he comes up with. I that man is genius. So absolutely, yeah. And his odd future work, awesome, awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh man. So we've been almost we've been having a lot of fun with this. Almost an hour and a half discussing just a lot of great issues. Um, I love, I've been enjoying getting to know you more from your artistic standpoints, and then you and what you're passionate for making a change. So I thank you, Owen, for taking the time to coming on this. Do you have anything else to, to add or to say before we do just the last part of this podcast? I'll just say, go peep my shit. Go check my Instagram out at Owen, O-W-E-N-H, period, D-U-N-N-E. That's Owen H, period, D-U-N-N-E, Owen H, done. Um, you can go find my music on Spotify under odd, which is OHD. And there's usually a link on my Instagram to that. My Twitter is the same thing. And then I have an Instagram account too. I mean, a YouTube account that I post content to. So um, then it's been a pleasure. Seriously. All right. So we'll go with our final and I'm really excited for your answers on this Owen. So every day mm -hmm. as you know, inside the actor studio or mm -hmm. heard of it. So mm -hmm. you're aware of the Proust questionnaire? You heard of it? Mm-hmm. All right. So why don't we do it? It's your turn to answer the Proust questionnaire yourself. All right. So, yep, every and then. You ready to do that? Oh, wait, sorry. What am I answering? What? <laughs> so, uh, you know, James Lipton, Inside the Actor Studio, he asked these 10 questions to every guest he's had, known as the Proust questionnaire. It comes from an old French TV show. Okay, and cool, yeah. 
So it's not rapid fire. It's just uh, like 10 short but deep questions. And I just really excited for your answers for them. Go for it. Yeah. My first question, Owen. What is your favorite word? Fuck. I love that it can use, it can mean anything. It can mean literally anything. Fuck can mean anything. It can be good, bad. You could say fuck 15 times in a row and it could mean 15 different things. And you put a what the in front of it and it's the most (laughs) magical phrase in the the world. Well, that, I just, I just. I know, right? (laughs) (laughs) And so me. So, what's your least favorite word? Mm. Well, I'm going to go with obvious one. I'm going to go with nigger is my least favorite word, probably. Mm-hmm. Not the biggest fan of when it's ever said at me or in general or reading a book. That hard R just rubs me the wrong type of way. So I'd probably say that's my least favorite word. Fair enough. Fair enough. Man. <laughs> um, the next question. Why do things just bleed? Okay. Next question. And this question isn't, I mean, it could be. This isn't necessarily a sexual question, but when I ask people, just hop okay. to it. If, if it is, you know, power to you, but um, this is just life, whatever that brings. But what turns you on in this world? That's very sexually still the question. I think a <laughs> yeah. really beauty. I think beauty, and I think that beauty you find in many different places. Like you can find beauty in a person who's just really doing what they really do really well. There's beauty in like art or someone really doing an accounting something really well or really paving a street really well and just getting that zone i think that's i love so that really turns me on all right i love it what turns you off um shitty energy i just don't really have time for people who can't control their energy and the energy they put out there and aren't accountable for it because i feel like that we all can be accountable for our actions we can't be control and accountable for our feelings always we can always be accountable what we do with those feelings and our actions a freaking man to that i i i I, I, that's probably my answer to that question, honestly. Okay. Number five, what sound or noise do you love? I love the sound of a blow dryer. It's my favorite thing <laughs> in the fucking world. I sleep to it. I turn it on to like, like just listen to it. I, I'm obsessed with it. It's a guilty pleasure. No one, most people don't know that about me, but I love blow dryers. I did, I did not expect that. All no, right. No one I love does. it. No one ever does. The sound <laughs> of a blow dryer. Yeah, if someone really knows me, they're like, oh, yeah. It's weird. It's weird. <laughs> hey, I support it. What sound or noise do you hate? The vacuum? Oh, uh, the sound of people. And I love the vacuum. I hate the sound of people chewing. I hate the sound of people chewing. Yeah. It really drives me insane. I will fuck it. drives me fucking insane. <laughs> uh, yeah. I hate big gulps too. Uh, mm, 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 uh, mm. I hate noise, mouth noises. They're gross. Yeah. You know, what's great about these mics is, you know, they are really quality, but there's some mics that you have to pay a good buck. Yep. Yeah, yeah but they, I hate all that shit. I have to take a second off half a second off to take it away but there, there are mics that automatically do it for you but you have to pay like a thousand dollars yeah so, nowhere. one day though seriously one day right <laughs> what's your favorite curse word fuck <laughs> Actually, i love cunt i love cunt it's just such like a perfect word because it's so used so perfectly like you're a fucking cunt that's cunt as fuck like, it's so many just different great times. You see, like, you're really shitting on these hoes if you bust a cunt. So, like, you know, that's how Man, I feel. I talk about linguistics. <laughs> right, I don't know. What profession other than your own that you would like to attempt? Or I should say the few professions other than your own. Oh, is this in, like, an ideal world? Like, okay, I would love to be a stripper. That is something <laughs> right. I always fucking wanted to do to get there and get butt naked and freaky as fuck, especially on like a cam show boy or something <laughs> on a camera. But I couldn't do that because like, I would feel weird about my parents and people seeing it out there. But if it wasn't like mm-hmm. a taboo thing, I'd probably be something like a sex worker or something because like, I enjoy sex. I'm good mm-hmm. at it. And I'm very like comfortable and like confident in myself as a sexual being. So I'm like, fuck it, right? Let's do it to it. I Let's love that money. confidence. This do you th- dick shouldn't be free. Fuck so good, this shouldn't be free. <laughs> like, you know. Do you think with the rise of OnlyFans that sex work is may soon be ta- um, oh, not, yeah, maybe not already, as taboo? It's, become, it's on the it's right on the right pack. Now. It's already becoming less taboo. So that's what's going to happen for sure. Yeah. I'm trying to have someone on OnlyFans 
trying to find someone to explain their experience, you know, wherever oh, they know come 15 from. 15 million people. I can send you a link. I'll send you somebody. Seriously, I, I just friend. want to talk about the empowerment it gives, the, you know, yeah, what that experience. I have a friend, Please. she's a trans woman. She's on the OnlyFans. I'll send you her link. Yeah, whoever's Sorry, whoever's yeah. down, I'm I'm definitely yeah. for it. So please, I, I I'm really, I'm genuinely interested. You know, when I asked first, people thought I was being a dick about it. Like they thought I'd be Howard Stern. So what's it like to, you know, if they're doing OnlyFans to get fucked or something? No, it's I it's I I mean they could talk about it if they want, but it's more about like the rise of popularity and the empowerment it's giving and mm-hmm. yeah. starting to break this um sex race taboo. And that's what I want to talk about with it. So yeah, if you have anybody and anyone's willing to talk, we'll um we'll share their story. I also keep forgetting your recording video and I look at myself and then zone out and I'm like, oh, God, <laughs> stupid. And I'm like, oh, shit. This is no worries. Um, <laughs> we've, had, we've had worse. <laughs> People, uh, I had one person fall asleep. Oh, that's real. That's real. That's real. So they're not, they actually didn't have the podcast. They didn't make it. That's, there's three, there's, sorry, there's four podcasts that are on release. Three because, or no, sorry, three. Um, Two of them because of dumb reasons that they, um, I record the show and I told them, remember, you're recording with everything. And they just, you know, I just think they chickened out, to be honest, and they're lost. And then the other one, because they fell asleep and they, I was like, you'll, I'm going to bore the audience if I put you on. But, <laughs> well. Anyways, what profession would you not like to do? Like, like touching, you got to touch people with, I fucking hate touching people. So no I TSA hate touching people. No, I hate like like something like a doctor, like a oh, dentist, okay. or like some shit like that. I fucking hate touching people. Although I'd probably be pretty fine. I just don't like touching people. Like, I don't like gross shit. Like uh, <laughs> I'm like you're sick. Go the fuck over here. I like, go over there. Why are you coming near me? All right, all right. So my final question, Owen, before we say goodbye, if heaven exists, what would you like God to hear say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? What's up, my nigga, is what I want God to say to me if I arrive at the pearly gates. Like, I just want him to be like, what's fucking good? And he's sitting there with a fucking blunt and, like, maybe some Hennessy and some chicken wings. Like, I would be turned to a straight-up nigga at that moment, but, like, I literally would live for that. That would be the best thing ever. And he'd be like, man, that racism shit, bitch. I would be like, right? (laughs) I I think God would be just the ultimate homie, so that's what I want him to say. I want him to be the homie. Now, that's... Now that sounds like heaven, but Owen, I really enjoyed this. I hope you'd want to do this again. This was really sweet. It it absolutely was. And like I said, anytime you want to promote your music, anytime you want to promote your upcoming films, please, as the audience is growing, we got to get more heads to there and especially make a rise for black queer filmmakers too, and just show the awesome stuff and talent they have. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad I got an ally. Woohoo. Hey, it's the right thing to do and just someone and something gently passion. I just love storytelling and I just want everyone to tell it wherever you come from. I'm glad you should tell other people that. (laughs) All right. Again, if you want to check out Owen Dunn's content, you could go to his Instagram page, which, which is, excuse me. So I, excuse me, just go to Owen, just go to Owen H dot Dunn. One word. On his Instagram, go to his YouTube. Go check out OHD on Spotify and Apple Music Odd. And anything else? I got all the plugs in. That's everything, you know. All right. Stay safe, Owen. Good luck in New York. When you go back to NOLA, get safe. And again, let's stay in touch. And I can't wait to do this again. Yeah, have fun. (laughs) So long, buddy.